that. Oops. Okay, Kim, you can go ahead and unmute and start. All right, I wanted to welcome everybody. So we've got 23 so far. We'll probably get about 10 more people, I'm hoping. This is our first virtual JGS of Southwest Florida meeting. And there's a couple of people that I would like to thank that are in this room today. And the first one I'd like to do is thank Jim Haberman for setting up the Zoom today. Thank you very much. We could not have done it without you. Another person we could have not done without is Howard Finkel, who's our program chair. We, I thank him for, for setting this up today. And of course, I thank Ed. I heard him speak at the Lakewood Ranch Geological Society and enjoyed hearing him so much that I asked him if he would speak for our group today. And luckily, he agreed. And I am going to give you two quick points about tracing your family and listen very, very carefully because to me, these are two of the best points you'll probably hear in many months to come about tracing your family. I don't know if many of you know that if you go to the Family Search website, you can sign up for a free, that's free, 20 minute consultation with somebody to help you with your genealogy. You can only do this once a week. And I set up two sessions in October. And when you sign up on the Family Search website, you say what kind of help you want. So the person that they set you up with is very knowledgeable about the area of expertise that you need. Like I wanted somebody who could help me translate Polish and Russian documents. They gave me a person who could do that. and. In those two sessions, I was able to find out the names of two of my great, great, great grandparents. So I highly recommend going to Family Search. The other recommendation that I have today is to take a genealogy course. And you can do a course online. Right now, the Jewish Gen website, if you go to their education link, they're offering a three-week course on how to use Jewish Gen. It's a three-week independent study course. It's $150. And it's not that you have to go at a certain time. You have two teachers. There's between 10 and 15 people enrolled in the class. And you interactively send emails to your two teachers. And they help you throughout the three weeks, 24-7. So there's this class starting on November 30th and it's running through December 19th. If you're really interested, do it quickly because it'll probably fill up, uh, well, it, I would say in a day or two. So that's all that I have to say. Now I'm going to turn the mic over to Howard Finkel, our, our, um, our program chair. But one just quick thing, if any of you are interested in joining our society, go to the JGS of Southwest Florida website and click on contact me. And we'll be happy to take your $25 as a single member and $30 for a family membership. Okay, Howard, it's all yours. Thank you, Kim. Um, I have done that. All right, I should be on. Um, thank you, Kim. And welcome everybody to our, our season. This is uh, our unusual season. Uh, this is the first time we've tried this for obvious reasons with, uh, with COVID and everything. And um, I wanna thank uh, Jim as, as Kim did uh, for his tech, uh, technological expertise. It has really, really helped us to put this together. Um, along those lines, I want to uh, ask everyone to bear with us uh, in case we have some technical difficulties along the way, because uh, we're all uh, brand new at this as well. So uh, just a couple of quick things. Uh, uh, you can, if you're having a problem where the um, uh, speaker image frame is, is being obstructed by the, by the um, uh, frames of, of the attendees, you can drag that to other parts of the screen uh, in case you didn't know that. I uh, also want to tell you that we're gonna entertain the questions at the end of the presentation. And we'll talk at that time about how to, how to raise your hand to, uh, to uh, ask a question. Uh, and also ask you to keep yourself muted during the presentation so that we don't have any interruptions. Before I uh, introduce Ed, 
I want to tell you about the uh, season that we have uh, prepared for, for all of us. Uh, in addition to today, on December the 20th, our next uh, meeting will be David Levinson, and he's going to speak about Jewish Germany and enduring presence from the 4th to the 21st century. On January the 17th, Peggy Jude, who is the president of the uh, Manatee County Genealogical Society, will speak about uh, DNA, about using the DNA websites, a tour of the tools you can use to find your ancestors. On February the 21st, Diane Jacobs will speak on the success, on success stories using Jewish Gen. On March 21st, Deborah Long, as uh, topic is out of the whirlwind resources for Holocaust research. And then our final meeting will be on April the 18th and that uh, is to be determined at this point. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully we'll all attend with us uh, during the course of the season. We think these are gonna be some great programs and I uh, hope you will find them uh, valuable. Um, let me introduce Ed at this point, uh, Ed Sandbach is uh, actually spent nine years of his youth growing up on three different continents. Uh, his schooling included attendance at the Ringling School of Art where he studied commercial art and photography. After graduation, he moved to Dallas, Texas and worked in professional photography for 28 years. His interest in genealogy began in the 1980s and grew out of a love of old family photos. He has assembled many family history books that include stories about his ancestors, and he is currently converting this material to a digital format. Uh, Ed began writing his own memoir stories in 2008 as short vignettes of the different experiences and memories of his life. Uh, it is important uh, for each generation to record their stories for future generations. Ed currently hosts a memoir writing group at the Braden River Library in Bradenton. And he is speaking to us today about writing our memoirs and dating old photos. So Ed, uh, you have the floor. All right, well, the, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Kim, for inviting me and, and Jim and Howard for helping to make this process work. Uh, I am uh, very pleased, uh, very kind of excited to be able to speak to uh, such a good group of people. Uh, I've put a lot into this program. I've done a, quite a few programs through the years, starting uh, actually about 10, 10 or 15 years ago in, in Dallas, where I was uh, doing some presentations there. But uh, I really like genealogy. And uh, I just wanted to note that I uh, wonder if any of you know what the oldest genealogy book in the world was ever written. Uh, and I'll answer that for you. The oldest genealogy book ever written is the Torah. And in Genesis, it goes through uh, the genealogy of names. And uh, I think that's so important. And if names like Adam, Noah, Isaac, and Jacob, if those names are important uh, in the Torah, then they are important enough for me. And uh, anyway, so I'm going to now switch to the uh, PowerPoint program that I have. I've got behind me an antique eight by 10 camera uh, from the 1800s. Uh, I've got some of my genealogy family story books behind me, but at this time I'm gonna go ahead and start the PowerPoint. Uh, let's see here. All right. So Anyway, so I've been into photography a long time. This is a picture of me in 1988. And as a photographer, we always say, just one more picture, please. Just, just wait, just one more picture. And I have gone uh, far and wide in order to get uh, good pictures. And so traveled, uh, you know, here and there. And uh, this actually, Looks like I'm climbing straight up, but uh, the lens creates an, an illusion. So I'm actually laying down, uh, but uh, anyway, so, but it's, it's photography can be a lot of fun. So these are some of my family old photos and I really love the old photos. Uh, 
I started with one photo and it just grew from there because it's like, well, who's this person? Who's that person? And it just kind of grew and grew. But uh, there's even a picture of a ship that my great great grandfather migrated to the, to America on from Europe. And this is uh, just showing how important it is, though, that we copy the old photos. So this is just kind of a cute display. This is an old photo. They can be copied with a camera. They can be copied with your cell phone. They can be copied with a scanner. But it's important to copy old photos. And uh, if you go to a family reunion, in fact, now with the cell phones, be sure and, uh, and remember that you can copy photos there so that you don't have to ask people to mail them to you, although now people can email photos. But if you, it's always easier in a way, if, if you just are able to do it yourself, then uh, you don't have to ask someone else to, uh, you know, anyway. So it's very important to copy old photos. So this was the very first photo that I copied. This is uh, Edward Mitchell, my great grandfather. And uh, so this was taken in 1918. And at that, when I was doing my genealogy, he and the, uh, my great grandmother had already passed on, but uh, a few of the children were still alive. And I was uh, the little girl sitting down in the front was my great aunt Ruth. And when she was like 90 years old at a family reunion, she even w made the dress that she wore at the reunion. But I had copied photos that she had taken previously. And she was so delighted that I was interested in her parents. And I sat down with her for a long time. I wish I had recorded it because uh, I mean, I it really warmed my heart to know that she, and then we continue, uh, we began to correspond back and forth. And then my sister even asked me, she goes, why doesn't she write to me? And I said, well, if you write to her first, she'll write you back. Uh, but anyway, so I started with that photo and uh, the old photos look uh, a bit stiff and that's because the exposure on the camera was a few seconds or, you know, a number of seconds, people can't hold a smile uh, for that long. So people gent wouldn't smile in a photo because they couldn't hold a smile that long. This photo is a sample. The dog, his, he moved his head during the photo. This is probably around 1912, 1914 or so. Even then the exposures were a few seconds. So the children could sit still, but the dog, doesn't understand. So I just kind of show this as a sample. So people in the 1800s, they weren't so stiff and stuffy like maybe we think that they were. So these are some samples of uh, the old photos. The earliest photo would be the daguerreotype. That's the bottom left. Uh, started in 1839 in France. Uh, then the, the CDV, the uh, became a popular because they could make multiple prints. It was a print on paper. The, the picture there is a picture of the, uh, the midget Tom Thumb taken by Matthew Brady. And I like collecting old Matthew Brady photos. He was the most famous photographer during the Civil War. And this is actually was handed out at the wedding and it's even signed on the back probably by their wedding planner whatever. So com so his real name is Charles Stratton and his wife's name was Elizabeth Warren. So then there's the, the tin type, there's an ambro type. The ambro type was a photo on glass. They, the photos deteriorated, came loose from the glass. So it only was used a few years. Uh, so, and then the cabinet card. So the CDVs and the cabinet cards being the lesser expensive process were more abundant in use in that. And the cabinet card is called a cabinet card because they made a furniture piece, a cabinet that would specifically hold the pictures in groove slots inside the cabinet. And that's how it actually became called the cabinet card. Then I'm not gonna go through these one by one. This will be part of the digital handout that I have, but these are samples of photos going through the years. So about every 10 years, there's changes in the photos uh, in somewhat how they pose, how the picture is printed, 
the edge, the paper, the thickness, there's different changes uh, through the years and obviously they were all black and white or sepia. If there was any color back then, it was hand colored. So color photography didn't start until about the, the 19, uh, late 40s. So then here's uh, coming up. I kind of ended these uh, samples in 1974 is my last sample. After that, it's pretty much we can figure out, uh, you know, what, what the pictures were. I didn't feel it necessary to make another page. But uh, anyway, so these are all just samples showing in by looking at a picture, if you can pick about a 10 year window when a family photo was, then you should be able to assign what generation. And that's important because if the first name is on the back of the photo, first names are oftentimes carried over generation after generation. And if you don't know which generation, then, then you're, you're stuck as to who it is. But by looking at the photo, if you ha don't have the original photo and you're just looking at it, then you can somewhat assess the way that they're posed uh, and how they look in the photo, the clothing in that and how they're posed can kind of help date the photo also. So generally the pictures in the 1800s are all gonna be posed pictures where it wasn't until you know around 1910 or so that people started getting their own cameras and so then they had more random type photos. So this is uh, in England. This is uh, my father's name, family crest. There's a town in England called Sandback. Uh, we lived, so the three continents, I lived in uh, Cuba for five years. My parents were teachers. Uh, we lived in Spain for a year. Uh, my father was a professor of Spanish in Madrid. And so anyway, so we went uh, while we were in, in Spain, then we traveled around Europe while we were there in order to, to see things. And we obviously wanted to go to the town of Sandback. So we can't trace it back that far because that's in the year 1230. But it is an unusual name and it is, you know, going back in my, in my family's history. And so these are some of the, oh, I did say then the, the other continent was South America. I lived in uh, Chile for three years during junior high school. My father at that time was uh, the director of foreign aid uh, for agricultural development in Chile. Uh, these are some of the digital pages that I've made and I, I like showing the progression. I like having seeing a straight line keeping it simple i do like all the photos and i do have photos of uh, siblings of uh, some of my great grandparents uh, but i do like seeing having a simple straight line so these are my mother's mother's side and my mother's father's side so then these uh the Roy Strobing on the right, that's my grandfather. Uh, Thomas Wano would be my great grandmother's brother. But anyway, so I've created some pages with the photos and a little bit of description uh, so that it's, I like it, this is a nice display. If a book is all writing, there's a lot there, but it's not as nice to sit down and look through, especially to sit down with a family member on a couch and uh, kind of share family history together, family stories and go back in time. Uh, so as I was saying about photos, photos change, everything changes through the years. This is basically a hundred year difference between an old family pose picture and a modern picture. And uh, so there's a, a big change in things things are more wild what we wear. <laughs> we have color now. And uh, anyway, so there's the changes. Uh, my mother's family has been into farming for multiple generations. Everything changes and all these changes can become stories. So from a farm equipment tractor in the 1950s versus a modern one, this uh, on the right is a combine 
it weighs 36,000 pounds empty. And to give you a better idea, this is me on the ladder climbing up. The wheels are as tall as I am. And uh, it uh, takes, they were harvesting uh, soybean. It actually not only picks it, it shreds it out and disperses all the debris. The bottom picture is it transferring the soybean to a trailer and it's transferring at a rate of three and a half bushels per second. And the wheels, like I said, were as tall as I am. The wheels on the wagon are even twice as wide and the wagon holds 970 bushels and it makes that school bus look tiny. Uh, so here's uh, some camera changes through the years. It used to be film, uh, box cameras. There's even a stereo camera that was a fad for a while. Uh, the brown camera on the left is an autographic style pen. That uh, silver chrome looking piece, uh, it's a stylus <clears throat> kind of uh, to the left of the lens. You could pull that out and there was a little tab you could pull down on the back of the camera and you could sign the photo. And the photo has a paper backing so it doesn't expose when you open down that little window. Although film is a negative, you had to sign your name backwards. So if you see an old photo, they're not that common to see because people generally didn't do it because it was too hard to write your name in a little window backwards, but uh, they didn't really have such poor penmanship. It was just that they had to sign backwards. So this is uh, kind of just for fun. This is showing the different flash bulbs through the years uh, from very large flash bulbs to very tiny and a flash bulb. It took one flash bulb per picture, whereas now the flash is used uh, repeatedly. There is no switching out of the, the bulb. But anyway, I, this uh, just a collection of old flash bulbs. So the photographer had to carry all these around with them. And uh, the ones in the top row are actually pretty good size. They're as big as a 250 watt and even like a 500 watt size bulb. Uh, these are some, old, some changes through the years. <clears throat> The top is actually a glass lantern slide. So in schools, they could use this to have an educational program <clears throat> and a lantern. So it's put in a, basically a lantern where you have a, a light, like a kerosene light, and then a lens to project it onto a wall. <clears throat> then we had the film and then there's a slide film. And now we have the computer flash drives and the greatest thing about a flash drive is it holds hundreds or even thousands of photos. And it's the greatest thing for genealogy because you can put your family, all of your family stuff on flash drives. And if you have to have an emergency evacuation of your house, you can take a few flash drives with you and you don't have to suffer in trying to figure out what boxes of photos to take with you. So you can just take a few flash drives and they're, you're good to go. So <clears throat> here are some books. Uh, the, the picture of the two people in the top left uh, photo page are some of my great, great grandparents. Then the photo sideways on the right, uh, Peter Wannell, the man on the bottom, you know, sideways anyway, that's my great grandfather. But anyway, I was able to acquire this book at a museum in Iowa when I went back uh, with the funeral. I went to some of the small towns my ancestors are from and they had, I copied photos there. They were nice enough to let me copy with my camera, but I also bought some books that they had. And since my family had been in that county for, for you know, over a hundred years, there was books. So they are so the book's not about them specifically, but it's about everybody in the county that owned land and had uh, businesses. So here's another book, the Fitchel, Mitchell Folk. The little one was passed down through the family, but the other one was just another book I was able to get at a museum. Uh, this is one of my relatives had made up a book and this is, uh, like I said, they'd been in farming for generations. 
and he put together a book with the family uh, history, but also mainly talking about uh, farming. And to think though, back in, in harvesting corn, uh, they used to have to do all that work by hand. Now we have machines to do almost all of it. Uh, this is my grandmother. This is her handwritten uh, cookbook that uh, my mother now has. And I wanted to show the page where it even showed how to make soap, but that page was so discolored, you can't see it, that I didn't use that as the sample. But this is all these different recipes on uh, making things. So just nice treasures and little things make up our human, our human personalities and our stories. I love, I remember my mother mate and my grandmother making uh, uh, shortbread cookies. And of course, kids love cookies. So it's one of the things that I really remember about her. This is my great grandmother. This is a letter that she wrote in 1930. And it's written in pencil. Even the address envelope is written in pencil. But I was showing this because there, we didn't have zip codes back then. Zip codes didn't start until the late 60s, but this doesn't even have a street address. So Rhinebeck in Iowa is a small town, but it means that the postman basically knew everybody in town. And nowadays, not only do we have uh, zip codes, but we have barcodes. And a lot of times we never even see the mail carrier if you're I live in a condo and our mailbox is at a central room. Uh, so thing, things change, but uh, also then looking at the letter, she wrote from edge to edge. Uh, they, you know, there was, they didn't want to waste any paper. So, uh, you know, waste, waste not, want not. So these are my great, great grandparents. And these two captions are taken from an autograph book that one of my great, great aunts, when she was 12 years old in 19, in 1888, she had a lot of people, I guess when she was in school, kids get an autograph book, but it was more than just signing an autograph. So my great, great grandfather, so he was born in 1813 my great great grandmother born in 1817, but in signing it, oh dear Gretchen, think of me when they bloom. Oh, see these roses bloom. Oh dear Gretchen, think of me when they bloom. You do that for yourself and me too. Think of me now. And then the my great great grandmother, dear Gretchen, listen to my troubles. You sing when you are happy and when you are not happy. The mornings are just fine. It makes your heart good. Think of me while you read this. Although my favorite one, it's not from a relative, but my favorite writing in the book was somebody wrote, if you see a frog climb a tree, then pull its tail and think of me. And I, I really like that. And it shows that, you know, once again, they weren't uh, stiff and, uh, you know, not fun people back then. So just these nice little treasures. I don't have the original book, but there's about 35 pages that are copied in, a, in one of the books that I have from one of my relatives. This is a, we lived in Cuba and we left in 1960 after Castro had taken power. Uh, my parents were teachers there and we didn't talk about Cuba much in, uh, in growing up, but I learned most of the history then later, you know, as I was doing my genealogy. Uh, but my mother told me that when they left Cuba, they didn't tell the school that they were leaving. They said we were going on vacation because they didn't want to possibly get stuck and not be able to, to leave the country. So they just said that we were going on vacation this summer and we were coming back, but we didn't go back. But this letter is written from a Katie Meyer 
they grew up in Germany and her brother, Dr. Meyer was a prominent doctor in Germany. And in 1937, he talked about the Nazi stormtroopers in the middle of the night uh, painted the windows on his office all yellow. And he realized that it was time for them to leave. So in 1937, they decided to, and they had to leave everything behind, his business, his house, his things, and they fled to Italy. And they started over, they were doing well. But in 1939, Mussolini was becoming similar dealings like Hitler, so they fled Italy. They wanted to come to the United States, but they couldn't get a visa, so they went to Cuba. He then was able to be create a good uh, medical practice for himself. They were uh, our family. He was our family doctor. Katie Meyer was a very, became a very good friend of my mother, and that she wrote letters to my mother through the rest of her life. They were never, they never did leave Cuba, uh, but this letter shows that also they, they had such little things, even paper, that she typed it from edge to edge. She wrote in some of the letters how it, they'd have to wait over an hour to get a bus. When they would go to the grocery store, they would have to wait in line to get in. And when they got into the store, there would only be one aisle of food in the entire store. There would only be a few items that they could get. So that was uh, some very tough times, but just because of their name, even though he was a prominent doctor and revered, because of his name, they had to leave. They were being uh, targeted. This is a, a group of a couple of books of stories written by my great uncle. And he wrote about uh, the horses. Uh, the horses, uh, they all have different personalities. The horses all had different jobs. Some were good for helping to plow the field. Some were good for riding. Some good for uh, pulling the buggy or, or a wagon, but, uh, uh, but they all had different personalities. He wrote about uh, trips, and I love a story he wrote about uh, after college. He and a couple buddies uh, hopped a train and were hiding on the, the roof of the train, but they got caught, and instead of getting kicked off, the, the, the train conductor uh, engineer had made them, well, at, had them, uh, other than getting kicked off, had them stoke the, the, the fire with the coal. So they did that in order to, in a sense, uh, pay their way. And so then they went as far as they could. Then they ended up hopping another train and there were some hobos on the train. They said, but the hobos didn't bother them because they were dirtier than the hobos were. <laughs> And that was from after, uh, you know, having to work all that coal on the train. And uh, this is uh, just some of the uh, stories from the horses. The, uh, I love the, the lower picture with them on the wagon. They're actually getting ready to go to school. Uh, the little story above is actually written by my uncle. And later in life, I was sharing some of my stories and he talked about how he rode a horse to school and I told him he should write a story about it. Uh, a lot of times people don't, don't think that their stories might be interesting. Uh, but anyway, so I encouraged him. And uh, so it's, it's a nice treasure to have that he actually, this is him on a horse. So I, st I started writing stories. Uh, this is a picture of me in Cuba. And so I started writing stories. And at first my stories were only 250 to five or 600 words. Uh, now my stories are 1,000 to 2,500 words. Not that I'm trying to make them longer, but it becomes easier to write, easier to say more. Uh, and at first, uh, one of the stories I wrote, Joining the Parade, uh, 
is, is only maybe 250 words and I should go back and rewrite it. Uh, but I, you know, it, it's easy to have an idea, but to be able to expand on it, but it becomes easier and easier to, to write stories. Uh, one of the first stories I wrote is my childhood allowance. I got 10 cents a week for taking the trash out. My sister got 25 cents a week for doing the dishes. And after a while, I thought, my goodness, she's getting more than twice I am. Now, she was four years older, but she was getting more than twice I was. And I says, well, you know, I, I want to earn more money. And they said, all right, you can help with the dishes. And well, then I realized that doing the dishes was every day. Taking the trash out was only once a week. So... I didn't think it was worth it to devote that much time to helping with the dishes, you know, when I was only, you know, like four year, four or five years old. Actually, uh, my, I'm sorry, that would have been in, in Lakeland, Florida, when I was probably like in the first or second grade. But so I, I wrote a bunch of stories that year. And uh, one of the stories I wrote was about my grandfather. Now this is uh, him coming in Cuba this is at the Isle of Pines off the southern coast of uh, Cuba. He's got a barracuda, and that's just a little boat. It's only about uh, four and a half feet wide or so. But I remember I always knew in Lakeland, Florida, I always knew when my grandfather was coming because a box of worms would arrive in the mail ahead of time, and it would say, keep refrigerated. And... As a kid, I, you know, hey, we got to put this in the refrigerator. Well, my mother didn't want to put them in the refrigerator. And I said, but, but it says, put, keep refrigerated. And she goes, but they, they're, they're, they're stinky in that. And I said, but we don't have to open it. They're not going to get out. So, but anyway, so that's, you know, as a child, we, uh, we don't understand uh, everything, but, Anyway, but I always knew when my grandfather was coming because the worms would come. So uh, a couple years ago, I wrote a story about uh, my childhood in Cuba. I did a lot of research, and I know the Castro took over, but I didn't know until I did the research there was actually three different revolutionary movements against Batista. There was uh, Fidel Castro, Jose Echeverra, and Frank Pais. And now Jose Echeverra was at the university, so he was also in Havana. Frank Pais was all the way in the uh, far east end of Cuba. Uh, but Castro created the first uh, kind of attack on the government. He was kind of defeated and retreated out into the mountains. Uh, but anyway, in I... I wrote the history in one font, and then I wrote what happened in my home life with my family in a different font to be able to see a separation of the two different stories. But I went back and forth as the time frame of what happened and what was going on also at home. And I wrote this part of it that at about three years old, I was uh, not afraid of heights and I went out on my balcony and climbed up on the railing and was walking around. And one of the neighbors uh, came over in a frantic, tell my mother, you know, I was going to fall. And, but anyway, but I'm not afraid of height. In my stories, I like to end with something that is uh, meaningful, some meaningful thought. And the end, uh, the end of this story, I wrote, the revolution had lasted for over five years and countless lives were lost in the struggle. It affected so many. For me, I only have the good memories about Cuba, my school, my home life with my family. The revolution was not part of our lives and our thoughts and worries. We didn't have a TV. We had each other. I had no worries. We ate dinners together and played games. My parents didn't let the news change our way of life. As an adult, my family still didn't talk about the revolution. Cuba would be in the news from time to time, and we would think about it. Uh, we would think 
about our having been there. News becomes history, family lives becomes memories. I was lucky not to have anyone close to me fight in a war. News is only news and may not be necessary for our day-to-day -day lives. News will pass and time will go on. What is important in our lives? We can decide what matters and how to spend our time. We can choose what memories we want to think about and what is important to us. And I like that thought. If we can think about, uh, think about what we want, uh, and uh, anyway, so actually this is a picture of me. This is actually what I read. The picture of me, I'm, I have my little school uniform on. It was uh, called Candler College. I still have that little patch that's on my shirt. And ironically, Castro's son went to the same school that I went to, but he was older, so we weren't in the same class. So this is uh, a story I wrote about my time in Spain. Uh, well, just one, one little part of it. This is about riding the trolley. I had a friend that lived uh, a number of miles away and I had to take a trolley to get to his house. And one time coming back, the fare had gone up and I was short 10 centimos and that's less than a 10th of a penny but I was short that much and I was so scared it was too far for me to walk and I was scared that I would get kicked off the trolley if I didn't have the money. So I waited until the people in the back had cleared out and I scurried my fingers through the dirt on the floor and found a coin. So it was about a peseta and a half or so to, to ride the trolley, but it had you know, it gone up a little bit anyway. I, I was so scared as a little kid that I didn't have enough money. And to think though, the amount that I was missing was so little, but yet it was what's required to pay the fare. But I, I found the coin and was able to pay. But little thing being so scared, uh, you know, it, it just stuck in me. And uh, so I don't have a picture of the trolley, so I use pictures of some of the old coins and little paper money to, uh, to uh, dress up the story. These are pictures I took in Spain, except for the picture of me in the middle. That's uh, the windmill. Those are the windmills from the story of uh, Don Quixote, so the Man of La Mancha. The upper left picture is Segovia. Uh, so anyway, these are just pictures that I took. And uh, I wrote another story about, well, I wrote a number of stories about Spain. Uh, something kind of ironic, we were uh, two parents, two kids and a baby. My sister, my younger sister was one year old and we actually put a little bed for her in the back of the Volkswagen window. So we traveled around <laughs> Spain on the weekends visiting places just in a little Volkswagen bug. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, I wrote a story called A Friend in Spain. And in Spain, there's not very many Americans in a foreign country, especially in the 60s. And went to the American School of Madrid. So it was uh, taught in English, but it was about half and half American kids and Spanish kids. And there was one boy that I became good friends with that we were the same age and uh, became good friends. But towards, uh, towards the end of my year being there, another boy had came to the school and was hanging around with, uh, with my friend and I. And after a while, uh, I was being left out of the mix. And so this is part of my story. At first, it was fun having a new friend in the mix. Then I noticed he was spending time with John and not including me. I asked John about getting together and doing something just for the two of us. After all, we were best friends. Then John said George wanted to get together just the two of them. I couldn't understand why, and I was being left out. I reminded John that he and I were best friends and George was the new guy. He said that George had told him that I was leaving Spain that summer and I would be gone and and he would still be there. 
I hadn't thought about that. It was true that I would be leaving, but it wouldn't be for a couple months. Why did George think about this and tell John? George wanted a friend and didn't want to waste time with someone that wouldn't be there for the next school year. I was hurt and couldn't understand why this had happened. John quit having me over to his house. John had been manipulated by George. So I, I was hurt and I moved so many times. And when you move, you are leaving friends behind. And, but that's an acceptable part of the change. But I was my, my best friend. I couldn't even hang around with them anymore. I, I mean, I was just so hurt. But anyway, it was, so, but I'll have to say Spain was probably the most fun uh, place that we lived at. I think also because of the age frame, when we lived in South America, I was in junior high and that was at a point where you want to go out with your friends and, and do more, uh, do more things out whereas uh, and it was harder and there's not very many Americans but but in Spain we're still kind of doing things with the family and but there was so much to speak uh, Chile was pretty but there aren't any castles in Spain in Chile so this is a story about Lakeland I wrote a whole bunch of little things that happened uh, to me in Lakeland one of them was about feeding the ducks at the lake. The lake was uh, just a few blocks away. My mother had sent my sister and I to the store to get a loaf of bread and some things. And we were walking by the lake on the way back and decided, well, we could feed the ducks just the, the end piece of bread. But then more ducks came and we thought, well, the, we can give them a little bit more. And then the swans came and the swan, we, I had to hold the bread over my head to keep the, the bigger ducks from getting at me because I, I was not very tall. I was in second or third grade. And then the swans came and they were taller than I was. And so I wrote about, uh, let's see here, then the the geese, anyway, they didn't want to wait and they started taking it out of our hands. Our fingers were getting in their way. We had to hold the bread over our heads while we threw the pieces far away to get the flock to move back. Then the swans arrived. With their long necks, they were as tall as I was. They were smart too. They just took the whole bag of bread and began to rip it apart. It was a free for all. We backed away with our lives and counted our fingers to make sure we still had all of them. And then when we got home and we didn't have the bread anymore, my mother was really upset that <laughs> we didn't have the bread. She, she didn't think that that was very appropriate for us to uh, waste the bread, a brand new loaf of bread on some ducks. Uh, but something kind of interesting, Lakeland, it was in the Sarasota Herald Tribune a couple of weeks ago. They uh, actually sold off about 40 pair of the swans uh, because they were getting too many. The swans were actually, uh, an original pair was donated to Lakeland in 1957 by the Queen of England, and they are descendants from uh, King uh, Richard the Lionheart. So they're uh, uh, historical, uh, you know, generations of birds. But anyway, they just had a, a special drawing for people to be able to buy pears in order to not have overcrowding on the lake. Uh, but uh, anyway, but I wrote a, a bunch of stories, different stories, put it all together. And like I said, at the, at the end of my stories, I like to have a nice thought and conclusion. And so I wrote, I miss that old house in Lakeland. Not really. I miss the good times that I had as a kid. I learned a lot from my parents. We all remember different things growing up. Some things only lasted a moment and some things took too long. Some things pleased us, some amazed us. Some things changed the way we think. I'm glad to have such wonderful memories. We can still live the memories in our stories. And this 
I never expected as a man that I would re ever write a story about a doll and doll clothes. But at my memoir group that I have at the library, one of the other members had written a story about uh, the doll that she had for her little girl, and she still had the doll. And when I came home, I told my mother about this story, and she got out a doll she had. This is then from 1940. She was 10 years old, and it, it came with one outfit, and her mother helped her make. Uh, her mother then made patterns, and my mother cut out the cloth and made all these other outfits. And back then they saved everything. So each outfit came from scraps from other family members. So the main uh, photo, that was cloth from my grandmother's trousseau. And one here's from my mother, a dress my mother had, uh, my uncle's coat, buttons from a coat. But anyway, all of these little outfits. And so, Let's see here. So the story is called With Mother's Help. As I look at the little dresses and pants that my mother made, I see a lot of love and care that was put into the little precious outfits. <clears throat> what were just little scraps of cloth became a special time for my mother with her mother. It is more amazing to know that each outfit has a history and a connection with family members. Little things in life can be great treasures. Something saved as scraps become useful again. The doll no longer tries on the little outfits and has tea time. The little clothes outfits now tell all the stories. I am grateful that my mother saved the doll in the clothes all these years. My, uh, my aunt actually later in life told my mother which outfits came from which family members because back in the time that my mother made them, she didn't uh, make note of those different uh, aspects. So, and this was still a long time ago, but when she pulled out the clothes, she had a little piece of paper with each outfit saying where the cloth came from. And all of these other members are passed on. My mother's still alive and one of her younger brother is still alive. Uh, but one of my cousins, my, my mother has one sister, and when one of her daughters came to visit just last year, I gave her the outfit that my mother made that came from uh, one of the blouses that had, was from her mother. And she, she didn't think that I should give it to her, but I said, but it's just been in a box. I've already uh, cataloged it, made a story, took pictures. I said, I, I think it's time to share. And there are... A, a, fact, there's a lot more outfits in this, but I said, I, I think it would be wonderful to, so she could enjoy it and she could share it with her sisters. And especially since it came from, the cloth came from her mother. Uh, but anyway, just wonderful things. So writing a story can bring about some wonderful sharing with family. I mean, if we don't write the, if we don't write the stories, then these stories are not going to be told. We can tell a story verbally, but if we don't write it down, uh, you know, you can tell a story and people may forget, but to write a story and just even these little things, they become wonderful stories. And even, like I said, giving that little outfit added another layer to the story. Uh, anyway, it's just, I think it's just very heartwarming. So anyway, here's a couple more of the little outfits. So, and this is actually the, the thing that I just read kind of in the conclusion. But uh, these are, these are hand-stitched little outfits and my mother was 10 years old. But uh, anyway, living on a farm, they saved everything. And uh, so, I wrote a little story about little things. Since we moved so many times, we weren't able to take big things with us. And these are just little things, little tiny things that I save. Uh, the, the medal on the left, actually I got it at school in Cuba and Candler College. 
um, my sister and I both got a medal for being the best student in our class. So I thought that was wonderful. And, uh, and ironically, it's called Candler College. And people say, you graduated college in 1959. <laughs> it's like, well, no, that was actually kindergarten, <laughs> even though it was called Candler College. But uh, the bus ticket is from Chile, and I saved it uh, because it was a bus ticket I'd taken over to a girlfriend at the time uh, th that I met at a party and I liked. And anyway, I had to take a bus to her house. And so I, I actually saved the, the little ticket. So little things can be important. Uh, little things can be important to those who save them. They can be questionable to others. They are related to our memories. We all have different memories, so we all have different things that we save. So family history and genealogy is like collecting and saving things. So family history and geology, genealogy is a form of collecting, gathering the names and the dates of our ancestors and putting them together in an album is a collection. Collecting the photos and the stories of our family members all require searching and finding the right pieces. Collecting is fun with no end of the search and discovery of new treasures. We can also collect our own thoughts and write our own stories. So, you know, once again, I'd just like to impress how, how important it is. And you can start by just writing down an idea for, an, for a story. When I first started writing stories, I did most of the writing on paper and then went to the computer to as such type the final copy. But I found it's, and that's I think why my stories were so short, but also, uh, you know, having more experience. But uh, now I have an idea turning in my head. I may write a couple sentences down, but I just go to the computer and it's so easy to move a sentence here and there, delete something, add something, you know, move something around. But it's so easy to write, and now I find myself sometimes uh, having a hard time keeping it under a couple thousand words. But I, I don't like my stories to be too long because I like the story to be short enough that somebody may want to reread it again. If the story is too long, then uh, you may not want to pick it up again. Uh, but keeping in mind those stories, imagine, in fact, uh, and we can, as we write, we don't have to use big words like Michael Crichton does. We can use just simple words, just like we were talking uh, to make it flow. There's a great writer, uh, Willa Cather, and she wrote uh, a, a, a sad but wonderful story. Uh, my Antonia about a hardship living, I believe it was in Nebraska in the 1800s. Uh, very sad story, but it was just such a hard life. But uh, imagine if we didn't have the diary of Anne Frank, what she was able to write down and keep for generations, not only is... Uh, shows the hardship, but it shows how warm her heart was in being able to persevere through that. And it, it gives hope for others. And so there's two female writers. There's another one, uh, The Little House on the Prairie. I got a name off the top of my head, but anyway, there's, there's some wonderful female writers. Uh, not that men can't be good writers too, but, uh, I, I like writing stories that, uh, I don't want to say make you think, but that can may inspire. And, uh, but anyway, I'm very lucky that I haven't had uh, any real tragedies in my life. I've been uh, very blessed so far. And, uh, but anyway, but I just really want to encourage people to, to write stories and you can just write down an idea for a story and you don't have to uh, finish one idea before you start another one. Uh, and if you do have a sad story to write, try and write 
a fun story at the same time so that one story doesn't become uh, overbearing uh, so that you have a balance. Uh, but anyway, but I, I just really encourage, uh, I do have that uh, memoir writing group. It's at the Braden River Library. Unfortunately, they, the meeting room has been closed to the public. It has all the tables and chairs in there. So when people go to the library, they don't want it so that they can't sit there for hours. Uh, but I've been hosting that writing group for at least five years. And like I said, I have, I've learned from others, like writing the doll story. I never thought I'd write that. Some of these other stories, like the, the one about my childhood in Cuba, another person wrote about history and how they created electricity in their barn for the cattle before they did in the house because the cattle was a, from farming was a business and they needed, that was important, but it's, you know, thinking about that, you would think, oh, well, you put the electricity, of course, in the house first. The cows can, you know, they can watch TV later type thing. <laughs> but anyway, but all of, all these little things. So, but, any, but having that kind of history, then I thought about writing about Cuba with the history and my family life. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad. I, so I've been inspired, you know, by other people. And so now I think uh, we can uh, open this up to questions and I will close the PowerPoint and let people see, my, see me again and we can start for questions. Thank you, Ed. That was really, really a uh, wonderful program. And uh, I think you have shown us the importance of uh, recording our personal and family stories uh, for the future, for future generations. I think that was really good. So uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, one way to do it, I see a hand raised and I will do that. Another way to do it is if you, um, on a PC, if you uh, press uh, Alt plus Y, it will raise your hand. And on an on a Mac, it's option plus Y. So there are several ways, but I saw a hand up, uh, oh, it's missing. So uh, we've got one here, um, we can't see the name. Susan Rosen, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. With all the Spanish countries that you lived in, do you speak Spanish? Yes, I do, I speak fluently. Oh. And, uh, I've, uh, I kind of lost it a bit, but learned, learned it more, you know, kind of relearned it in Texas. There's a lot of Spanish speaking people, but I've, uh, when I go on vacation, different countries, I always make a point of talking to the locals in Spanish, but I've been on a number of medical mission trips. I'm not a doctor, but speaking Spanish, I'm one of the translators. And, uh, so I've, and actually, and I've, so I've really enjoyed, and in fact, uh, uh, we go to these little villages where they're so poor and I've, I kind of even walk around town a little bit uh, sometimes and get invited into people's homes and they're, they're so, they're poor, but they're so gracious. And uh, when the, the group had uh, like the afternoon off and they went to the beach, I just walked around town just talking to everybody, but I, I really, I enjoy speaking Spanish and I've, I've actually learned hello and I can say hello in about 12 different languages. I thought about learning some other languages, but if you don't use it, it's, you can't retain it. I can retain hello and that's about it in other languages, but thank, thank you. That, but I, I speak fluently. Uh, yes. That's wonderful. Other questions? I'm looking for hands raised. Uh, there's one, Barry. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Barry. Hey. Hola, como estas? No, we won't speak Spanish. <laughs> um, my, quest my question is, can you share uh, what kind of software you use to present your stories in book form or whatever form you've been sharing us? So today, right now, this was a PowerPoint program and I just uploaded uh, the pictures 
And in PowerPoint, you can also select insert text box, and then you can pick what font, what size. I tried to use a larger point size so people on a smaller screen uh, would be able to see it. And then I also did it in bold, but you can, you can select different backgrounds. You can select a, top, uh, a text box and, and just write the words in. So, and actually I just copied and pasted. If you right click on Microsoft Word on a paragraph, right click, uh, save, and then go into the, the text box and then right click again and paste. So it just pastes uh, what you want. And then if you wanna delete a few of the sentences, uh, but it's easy, it's easy to do. You can insert a photo and then you have to either largen or enlarge or reduce the size of the photo so that it fits. Uh, and then you can drag it where you want. So it's a lot of fun. So it's, it's all just done within uh, Microsoft Word? So the presentation today, yeah, Microsoft works the PowerPoint program. Is the, but you have a book or stories that you have for your family? Are they? Oh, so that's in. Like what's behind you on the easel? And... So that's in Microsoft Word. And in Word also, you can insert photos. You can put a border around it like a frame. And I actually have used a different font for the heading name for the different uh, family generations, just as something to separate. Uh, but anyway, so I've done a whole number of pages and actually I haven't even started on my father's side of the family. It's, you, you know, you work a couple of weeks, you know, eight hours a day for a couple of weeks and you get burned out, but, but it is a lot of fun. It's easy to do. Uh, it is a bit time consuming because, you know, got to have the dates accurate, the information accurate, the spelling. Sometimes you know, as I'm looking down, sometimes I transpose uh, something and uh, but anyway but it's, but that's actually Microsoft Word and uh, so okay so it's all within Microsoft Word it wasn't just any other special program that you were using no nope. look, look good thank you very much I like to keep things simple uh, me too. So I'm encouraged by that. So in fun. fact, I have uh, Adobe Photoshop, but I don't use it because it's so complicated. I use a simpler, in fact, even for retouching old photos, I use a simpler program for uh, retouching. I googled memoir groups and I didn't find find that group. Um, you said five years. Braden River, is that Bradenton? It's in Bradenton. It's on Highway 70, just north of Lockwood Ridge Road. You're not meeting in person now, are you? We're not meeting in person. Are you still meeting? Uh, I send them an email once a month as kind of a replacement of our in-person meeting to share some stories. I'll um, email you. I don't want to take up time now, but I'm interested in it. But it's a Braden, Braden River Library. Okay. Sometimes it was hard. To, they don't promote it enough. No, uh, I didn't see it. I generally would have about uh, 10, maybe 12 people at, at per meeting show up. Sometimes uh, I've had as many as like 22 people. But uh, It's interesting. I will email you to uh, get on sure. with it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Francis had a question. Go ahead. Hi, I just want to say hi, Ed. This is your your doll. Oh, yeah. inspiration. <laughs> Francis. Uh, Fran Kramer. Yes. Fran. Yeah. Uh, I I know her as Fran. So right. Yeah, she wrote right. a story about uh, her little girl's doll, and that inspired me. So <laughs> she she's, and not just that story, but the way that Fran writes. She uses such nice descriptions describing. The smell in the air and the uh, the flowers and just uh, you're gonna make me blush. <laughs> <laughs> the light of the day. She has. I'm not descriptive enough in my writing, uh, but she she's uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder is the writer of Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> she wrote one of her one of her stories was reminded me about that because it was so. Well, thank you, Ed. You're... And and it, and at her time in life, she was a child going to her grand 
parents' house in the country. Uh, but Fran has been one of the longtime members that's been a regular, and it's nice to see you, Fran. Nice to see you. And it's, it, I, you have told us little snippets of your life, but it was wonderful to see this presentation. So wonderful. Thank you, Ed. Well, I'm glad you could attend. Okay, I have, I have lost uh, everyone's pictures, so I can't see your hands raised. So if you want to um, you ask can, There's a blue arrow to the right of the screen. You can push that and see the next group of people. Uh, I'm not getting that. But if you want to ask a question, just go ahead and unmute and break in and ask your question. Uh, identify yourself first, please. Anyone? And I'll throw one out there. Ed, it's Chip. Oh. I was saying it's not a question. I just posted. I found this group by accident. A friend of mine mentioned it to me. Uh, this has been fascinating. I have been writing little ideas the whole time. So thank you so much. And also my, my married name is Stinkle. So who knows? Maybe Howard's a relative of mine. We're going to investigate that. But it's just... We're going to look into that. Oh, I'm going to start scanning the photos that's in a box in my guest room. Thank you so much. Uh, speaking of photos, Ed, I have a question. Uh, is there a particular application that you recommend to restore color photos? I have some old family photos and they're colored and they, they're fading badly. And I'm wondering what you use to restore that one photo. Uh, I actually... Are, I'm using mostly, I have a program, I bought a Canon uh, scanner that also scans film and negatives, and that program came with a, a pretty elaborate thing to adjust the colors, and it can also, uh, you can select just restore color when you scan something, so you can actually see it before you actually even scan it, whether or not you want to restore color or if something's backlit. So it's, it's a very simple process. I just click on that button and that's what it did. It just restored the color and I was, I was amazed. I, I thought I'd have to go in and tweak all the colors, but it just, cause it, you know, ha, I'm sure it has an algorithm so that it can, it knows that the sky would be blue and, and things like that. So it, but uh, there's, uh, I, I have Adobe Photoshop, I have Microsoft, uh, works, I believe that's another simpler one, but I, I kind of like starting with something simpler before I have to get into the, and even in edit photo edit, I can actually remove, a, although it requires a bit of artistic skill to draw somebody's arm back in, but in a photo that's really damaged, I can remove a bad stain but then I have to paint back in, draw back in what I took out. Uh, but, but anyway, but the, to restore the color, that simple thing, it was just a, a Canon uh, film scanner that it's actually a print and film scanner. And it was about $300. And uh, anyway, it comes with that program. It's real, real easy to work, real easy to tweak the colors, brightness, darkness, and uh, contrast and that. So it's a, a Canon film scanner. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions, Jim, you had one. No, oh, I was just gonna say, uh, Ed, I couldn't help but notice uh, your great-great-grandfather, your great, you, your great, great -grandfather, Samuel Young, you bear a striking resemblance to him. Is it just me or, or have you noticed that also? Uh, I haven't compared myself to him, I look I have a nose of the strobeans. I can actually balance a pencil on my nose, but uh, but I I've had a lot of people say I look like my great grandfather Edward, uh, but I, I've had people say I've had people say I look like Stephen King. <laughs> I've Maybe been stopped I've been stopped in restaurants and had to show my driver's license. They they thought I was didn't want the, the publicity or whatever. They said, oh, I know you don't want to be recognized. And, and I, even at the mall one time and somebody said it and I turned around, they go, well, if, if it wasn't you, why did you turn around? But, but anyway, but I, I'll, have to, I'll have to look at the Samuel Young picture and because that's, uh, it's, uh, I haven't compared myself, so I'll have to look and see. 
Okay, any other questions? So there's a question from Revels. She'll need to unmute her microphone. Maybe you should unmute everybody. I, I'm, I'm so accustomed to trying to make sure that I'm not interrupting when the presentation <laughs> is going on. But uh, could you give us your email address again? Yes, uh, yes, I definitely want. So it's Edward Sandback. All is one word. So Edward's easy to spell. Sandback is S A N D B. That's like dog boy. A C H at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to answer questions. I'll be happy to look at a photo. If you have an old photo that you want some help in trying to figure out uh, what age it is, I can uh, give you an idea. Uh, but I'll be happy. And if anybody missed, uh, so Edward Sandback at gmail.com, if you didn't get it all, oh, there it is. Uh, so Jim has posted it up there. So, and if you send me emails, I feel like I accomplished something. <laughs> I got people interested. Well, Ed, thank you very much. This was really, really interesting. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming and remind you again that on December the 20th, we will be presenting uh, David Levinson. Uh, and his topic is Jewish Germany and Enduring Presence from the 4th to the 21st Century. And with that, I'll close and say uh, good afternoon. Well, thank you for having me, inviting me. It's been a, it's been a a real pleasure to uh, to speak to everybody. I really have a lot of fun doing this. <laughs>